All right, well, some people get a little nervous when they're talking about sex and sexuality. Um, I've never been one of those people. And so that really makes people uncomfortable as I talk. And so I'm going to do my best to be led by the Spirit today. Uh, and, and last night we're sitting around the table, and um, I, apparently my, my kids share my gene of not being embarrassed to talk about anything uh, because I'm sitting around the table with them, and I told my kids, I have an 11-year-old, 10-year-old, 7-year-old, and 5-year-old, and I said, listen, guys, I, I think that today uh, you need to, to go in the back uh, and make sure that you're in the kids' areas today. You don't need to sit in to the main service. And uh, they said, why, Dad? And I said, well, because I'm talking about uh, the honeymoon part of Song of Solomon. And uh, so my two oldest girls, my wife has had the talk with them. And, and so my oldest daughter, Molly, she goes, hmm, like this, you know, just... <laughs> Like, she, she has the face, right? And then Julia, she can see that the two younger ones are sort of questioning, what, like, what's that talking about? And she goes, it's going to be about kissing, guys, right? And so, so then, like, I can see them sort of processing. Now, my 7-year-old and 5-year-old, we have not had the talk uh, with them yet, but my 7-year-old hears the word kissing, and, and Lainey, she goes, uh, and bottoms. It's going to be about kissing and bottoms. <laughs> and I'm, I'm thinking, okay. Uh, I, don't, I don't really know where this comes from. For, it, it, maybe one of your older sisters has been talking to you. Then my five-year-old decides, but wait, there's more. And, and, and so we, we have a boy dog now. And she's noticed the different parts that a boy dog has. Uh, and so she thinks it's hilarious to point and laugh at our dog and to say, weenie. All right? And so, so all of a sudden now, like, so, so here I am. And I'm like, don't come in tomorrow. We're going to talk about the honeymoon. And, and so Molly, mm -hmm. and then uh, Julia goes, kissing and then Lainey goes and bottoms and then my five-year-old uh I don't know where she gets this y'all but she says hot dogs and buns <laughs> and I I promise you like uh, the fried rice that was in my mouth like just came <laughs> shooting out and I'm like all right maybe you guys can come in tomorrow I don't know <laughs> uh, but listen um when it, when it comes to sex and sexuality, our, our culture says there are no rules, right? Whatever makes me have pleasure, whatever makes me feel good. I, I'm the king, I'm the authority over sex and my own body and my own sexuality. I'm the king over my sexual choices. And, and here's what I want you to know. People say that that leads to heightened enjoyment. And I want to tell you, if you look at the statistics of the world, all that it's led to is sex being cheapened. That's what it is. It's this cheapening of what God had in mind. People are much less satisfied when they live that way. When they're king over their own sexuality, they just say, well, I'm going to do what I want. It's my body. I'm going to do whatever, whatever feels good, whoever I want to be with, whatever I want to determine is my own sexuality. That's what I'm going to do because I'm king over it. So I'm going to do what I want to do because it's going to feel good for me. And so that means it's good. Listen, what would happen if we all decided to do that with traffic? Right? Like, this is my car. You can't tell me what to do with my car. I'm going to drive it however I want to drive it. And so if I want to go, I'm going to go. It doesn't matter if it's a red light, yellow light, green light. Like, if I want to go, I'm going to go. Like, what would happen? There would be death and destruction all over the interstate, right? And, and I want to tell you, that's exactly what's happened with sexuality in our culture. There, there's this thing that says, oh, well, I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to be what I want. I'm going to, I'm going to live however I want. And whatever feels good to me is sexually good. And what it's led to is this death of sexuality and this death to the actual plan that God had where he says, this is what sex can be like. And so today, we're going to look at his design for sexuality. We're going to look at how God designed sex because um, despite uh, all of us who grew up in a Baptist church, like God did make sex. Like it, it's part of his design, right? And so he looked at it. He said it was good. He, he gave us fun buttons. Like, he didn't have to make it fun. Like, it, it is fun. Like, and so God designed sex, and he has this plan for sexuality. And so we're going to look at his plan for happy, holy, and healthy sexuality in this passage in Song of Solomon chapter 4. And, and so, listen, I, I want you to write this down because the thing is, is we as believers have not talked about this for far too long. Like, we seem to think the world has a monopoly of being able to talk about sexuality. 
And, and so I think it's time for us as believers to sort of embrace God's plan for happy, holy, and healthy relationships, including sexuality, and to start to talk about it because his way is so much better. His way brings so much more joy. His way brings so much more freedom and so much less baggage. And so, so here's what I want you to write down today. We're going to sort of see this fleshed out in Song of Solomon chapter 4. Here's what it is. Sex is exclusively reserved and preserved for the one for whom your soul shouts awaken. And that may not make sense right now, but it will by the end of the passage. Just write this down. Sex is exclusively reserved and preserved for the one, for your spouse, for whom the, your soul shouts awaken. All right, we're going to see what this looks like in Song of Solomon chapter 4. We're going to start with verse 1. If, if you haven't read through Song of Solomon, chapter 3 is the wedding. And so he comes with this unbelievably beautiful carriage, and he gets his bride, and he takes her back to his palace. They have this moment of vows, and, and now they're at the honeymoon. And the way that they did the honeymoon, uh, any engaged people in the house, uh, the way that they did the honeymoon, here, here's what they would do. They would have the vow ceremony, then everybody would go to a party except for the married couple. They would miss their own reception. And they, they would go and consummate the marriage. And then when that was finished, they would come to the reception to party with everybody else. And so, so sometimes it was the next day. They would have multiple day celebrations. And, and so this was how they would handle things. So everybody's off at the party. They've had their vows. And, and now here's Solomon with Shulamite. Uh, after they've said their wedding vows, they're together. And, and I want you to see God's plan to bring this sexuality back to his way. Look at what it says. It's exclusively reserved and preserved for the one for whom your soul shouts awaken. So here's, here's Solomon. Here's what he says, verse 1. Behold, you're beautiful, my love. Behold, you're beautiful. Your eyes are doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats. I wouldn't necessarily lead with that, guys, but... I mean, he does. <laughs> Leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Listen, he starts out saying she's beautiful. Beautiful, you're, this word in the Hebrew is you're right. Like, ain't nothing wrong with you, girl. You are right. You're so nice, I had to say it twice. Like, this is, you are so, so beautiful. He lifts the veil back off of her face, and he sees her eyes. And he talks about her tender appearance. Your eyes are like doves. There's, there's such this beautiful purity about you. You have this gentle tenderness now this deal about their hair coming down like a flock of goats right like these goats uh, in this region they had long black hair okay there was this really fine wool and so he, he's looking at her black dark beautiful hair and hebrew women wore their hair how up or down do you remember they, they wear it up right like do you, do you remember in the story where jesus is there and and he's having his feet washed by this woman who lived an unclean lifestyle. What happened? She let her hair down, and then she started pouring perfume and then wiped his feet with her hair. And they're like, what is she doing? Why, she, she can't do this. She can't let her hair down. Like, only, only these prostitute women would do this, right? And so she has her hair up for the wedding, but then she lets her hair down in this moment. And so it cascades down her shoulders. He's like... Man, your hair is so beautiful, this dark black. It's like running down these mountains, right? Now look at what it says. I love this. Verse 2, your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes that have come up from your washing. Also, I don't know if I'd leave with that. All of which bear twins. Not one among them has lost this young. Do you know what he's saying? He's like, girl, you got all your teeth. That is amazing. <laughs> and they're not even wearing sweaters. Like, it looks like you just brushed them things. It's amazing. They're glistening. They're white. And you got them all. Like, that was a rarity back in those days. I look at what he says. I love this. He's kind of going down her body. Look what he says. Your lips are like a scarlet thread. Your mouth is lovely. Your cheeks are like the halves of a pomegranate behind your veil. Your neck is like a tower of David. Like, again, I don't know, guys. Built in rows of stone, and on it hang a thousand shields, all of them the shields of warriors. He looks at her lips, and he says, they're so beautiful, this hint of red that comes out. Your darker complexion, and you have these red lips, and he said, your, your cheeks are flushed right now. Like, he says, you're so beautiful. He talks to her about her neck, and he's not talking about that she just has this gargantuanly long neck, right? Like, that's a, girl, you a giraffe, right? Like, that's not... <laughs> That's not what he's saying. What, he, what he's saying is he looks at her, he's like, he, he says, there's something so regal about you. 
He says, you know what? I know that your life didn't start off like this. Your, your childhood, your home life, it was a terrible life. And you, you had this life out in the sun. You had to work hard for everything. You were never pampered. You were never taken care of. You were this hardworking girl. And he said, but I'm looking at you now. And the way that you stand and the way that you carry yourself, it's like you were always meant to be a queen. Think about this. This is amazing. Guys, you better jot some notes down. Here's what he goes. He keeps going. Look what he says. Verse 5. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle uh, that graze among the lilies. Until the day breathes and the shadows flee, I'll go away to the mountain of myrrh, to the hill of frankincense. All right, so what is he talking about? Because I don't know any woman that wants to be compared to like this little animal, right? Especially a hairy one. That's weird. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> But, but what is he trying to say here? He, he, he looks at her and now she's undressed. And, and so he's, she's standing before him and she's completely naked and he doesn't want her to be ashamed in any way. And so he looks at her and he's like, you're too breasts. He says, I'm going to approach them carefully and gently, right? Like he says, how do you sneak up on a baby animal? Like, do you just go in there and just be like, hey, let's play, right? Like, is that what you do? No, you don't do that. Like he says, he says like, like this little, little baby fawn, I'm, I'm going to pretend like we're at the petting zoo. Like, I'm just going to go very gently, very gently, right? He wants her to know that her body is not an object just for him to whatever. Like he, he wants to be tender, and his love and his caresses. And he says, I, I want it to be like the, these two little phones. And let's, let's be gentle, right? And so he goes on. He says, I'm going to go away to the mountain of myrrh, the hill of frankincense. He says, like, I, I, I just want it to, um, to, to be present with you in every way, right? And he's like, it doesn't matter, hills, mountains, whatever. I just want to be there. Like, I want to go there. Now, look at what he says. He keeps going. Verse 7. Now, I want you to imagine this. She's standing there, and now, now she's, she's totally naked in front of him, and, and he's, he's there, and he wants to reassure her. This whole thing, it's in him leading this conversation. Do you, you notice, I mean, she's, she's nervous about this, and, and he's trying to reassure her. He's just going down, and he's like, your eyes, your neck. Your, and so he keeps going. Look at what he says. He, he, he says, you're all together, what? Beautiful, my love. There's what? Read this one. What does this say? This is so amazing. There is no flaw in you you're flawless no blemish no defect no spot no stain no injury now, now is this reality of course not like are there things that she wanted to change about herself yeah absolutely there she even remarks about stuff in other passages in song of solomon she makes fun and he makes fun of her gargantuan nose like it's just something that they pick on each other about now like there's things about herself that she would totally want to change there's not one person on the planet i don't care who you are that looks at yourself and you're like darn right i'm a stud wouldn't change a darn thing at all right like there's not one person on the planet that sees themselves and thinks that exact well maybe some of you i mean you guys are spectacular but 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 like she's there and she wants to change things about herself but he wants her to know in my eyes you're what beauty looks like Guys, listen, I want to tell you, as, as men, th this is one of the most helpful things that you can ever do for your spouse is to look at them and say, you are all together flawless. Whatever you think about yourself, just know when I look at you, you are what beauty looks like. You are my standard of beauty. I don't care what the magazines say, what beauty looks like, or you have to look like this, or you have to have this kind of nose, or these kind of teeth, or these kind of ears, or these kind of whatever. Like, I, I don't need any of that. What God has given me is you, and you are what beauty looks like, and you are my perfect 10. You're altogether beautiful. Now, do you know this is the same word that Paul talks about when he says that the church is going to be made blameless? without spot or defect like in ephesians chapter 5 here's what he says husbands love your wives just like christ loved the church and he gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her having cleansed her with the washing of the water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot without any wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish he says this is you need to look at your spouse in the way that God looks at you. This is your, your thing that you're shooting for. This is how you can be truly naked and unashamed. 
Because you know, with that one other person, it doesn't matter what the rest of the world says, when they look at you, they think, that's my guy. When you look at them, that's my lady. And there's no fear there of what I look like, or oh, I need to cover up, or oh, I don't know if you're happy or satisfied with me because you say, no, no, what you are is what beauty looks like. You're God's definition of beauty for me, right? Now look at what he says. I love this. It's, he creates this atmosphere of exclusivity. He says, I'm not looking anywhere else. I'm not looking at anyone else. I'm looking at you. Now look at what he says, verse 8. This is amazing. He says, come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon. Depart from the peak of Amana, from the peak of Sinir and Hermon, from the den of lions. Read this with me. What does it say? From the mountains of what? Of leopards. He says, there's this place. These are literal places, and you always had to be so careful. It was a dangerous, dangerous place to be. These places along the roads, you never knew what was going to come out to attack you. You, never, you were never completely safe when you were going through this region right here. There was the place where lions would make their dens and leopards would make their dens. So whenever you were traveling through this region, you were always looking like on guard. Have you ever been hypervigilant? It's like when you go under overpasses on I-77 to make sure no cops are like, you know, with a radar gun. You know what I mean? You're just like hypervigilant with the stuff. He says, listen, this was your life before. I know what kind of family you came from. You walked on eggshells everywhere you went. Like you weren't appreciated. It was a dangerous place. It, maybe for some of you, it was like a, a performance-based love. Where if you do this, then we love you. And if you don't do this, then, you know, I don't know if you have my approval or not. He, he says, listen, I want you to know that the way that you should <coughs> think about our home is the safest place on earth. There's no danger here. Like, I want you to think about this moment. Like, they're both naked and they're unashamed. And before they ever come together physically, he wants her to know, I want you to know this. I'm creating a home for us of complete safety. You never have to worry about the things that you worried about in the past. You don't have to worry about being judged. You don't have to worry about being uncared for. You don't have to worry about being disliked. Listen, you don't have to worry about stepping on eggshells and making sure you don't upset me and awaken the lion. It's not going to be like that. Our home is a home of safety. More than any other place, this relationship is your safe zone where you're totally known and totally loved and totally cared for. Who wouldn't want to be in a relationship like that? This is God's plan. This is exclusivity to sexuality. He says, when you make this environment like this, when you preserve and you reserve your sexuality for the one person, your spouse, for whom your soul shouts awaken, this is what can happen. It's a safe place. Even when you're totally naked, there's no need for shame because there's no comparison. It's a safe place. Look at what he says. Verse 9, I love this. You've captivated my heart, my sister, my bride. That's weird. I'm just saying, but that's how they spoke to each other, all right? It's not like he's just saying we're a family now, all right? That's not how we would speak, but let's move on. He says, you have captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than what? Wine. And the fragrance of your oils than what? Any spice. He says, I cannot contain myself. He's like, my heart is gone just from one look at you. I can't imagine what it's going to be like when we actually touch. <gasps> right? He looks at it. He's like, you've captivated my heart one glance, and I'm done for. I'm a goner. Like, I cannot imagine what it's going to be like to actually be together. Woo! Right? That's what he's saying. Now, look at what happens. I love this. They go from talking to touching. Like, guys, that's, that's, that's an awesome thing, right? Like, there's, there's this talking before touching. It's not this like, hey, you want to? Right? I mean, and there's this creation of this environment that's totally safe for your spouse to feel totally loved and totally appreciated and totally accepted before you can be totally known. Now, look at what he does. I love this. As they kiss together, look at what he says. Your lips, they drip nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are where? Under your tongue. 
The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. Now, I don't know about you, but like the kiss he's describing, I thought it was called a French kiss. But apparently, like France was not a country for like another 2,000 years when this was written. So apparently, we've been calling it the wrong name the whole time. Apparently, it's a Hebrew kiss, right? Because he says, we're kissing together and your lips taste amazing. Honey and milk are under your tongue. He's like, your kisses, woo, they're so satisfying. It thrills my soul. It's unbelievable, right? He says, it's more intoxicating than any wine. It's a better high than anything I've ever known. This love is so amazing. It's better than any exotic spice. Like, this is what my life's peak moment is, right? That's awesome. Now, look at what he says. I love this, verse 12. This talks about the exclusivity of sexuality in the marital relationship. This is God's plan for great sex. It's this exclusiveness to sex. It's reserved and preserved for a husband and wife, for only one person for whom your soul shouts, awaken. Now, look at this. Here's what he says. Here's how we know that, verse 12. A garden what? A garden what? A garden locked is my sister and my brother. A spring locked. A fountain what? Sealed. Your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with choices fruit, henna and nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes and all the choice spices. A garden found a well of living water, flowing streams from Lebanon. He says, you've had all of this sexuality inside of you. And girl, you're amazing. But here's what you've done. You've shut it down just for me. You've preserved it. You've saved yourself for this moment. You were reserving and preserving your sexuality. Listen, you you could have been this unbelievable person, this sexuality with anybody. Anybody would be lucky to be with you. You could have been with anybody and it would have been amazing. But listen, I want to tell you, you reserved and preserved your sexuality so it would be this gift for me. And now you're saying, look, it's all of me. I'm here. And it's all yours. Like, I I was this garden locked, but now I'm presenting this locked garden. uh, This has been reserved and preserved. I'm giving it to you as this gift. And it'll only be yours. Only one person for whom your soul shouts, awaken. Listen, um, how many of you ever went to summer camp as teenagers? Any of you? Did y'all have like the guy talk, girl talk? Any of you have that stuff, right? Like there was always the sexuality talk. And I remember like the guy's room was right next to the girl's room. And the counselors had these little dorky phrases. And here's what they would say. Like they would always talk about sex. And they would say, sex is great in the bonds of holy matrimony, right? Like that's what they would say. And then they would make us repeat it like over and over. And then we would yell. And the guys would yell so the girls would hear it. And then the girls would yell so the guys would hear it, right? And so we'd be like, sex is great in the bonds of holy matrimony, right? Like so we, we got this thing. It was like the whole week right and they're shouting this thing out and then one of the counselors said hey guys can I just be super honest with you and we're like yeah and he said sex is great anytime (laughs) it doesn't matter if it's in the bonds of holy matter sex feels great anytime but it's only right in the bonds of matrimony he says sex feels good anytime you do it like yeah absolutely sex feels great but but it's only right in this exclusive relationship you can be this garden that's unlocked and it's like any old gardener can come by right like it's just like woohoo you know and it's fun for a season but the baggage that comes along with that and the things that you take into that marital relationship you can welcome pornography into your eyes and you can be like yes that makes me feel good in the moment but you have this shame and dirtiness that you walk around feeling like and you feel unsatisfied afterwards because it's not exclusive like what God's plan was you can read stuff all over and be like oh this is just getting me warmed up this is my crock pot for my novels and then I'm gonna be ready with my man whatever like you can do that but if it awakens something inside of you and it's not your spouse the one who's doing it then you're not going by God's plan like you're you're not reserving and preserving your sexuality for the one person for whom your soul shouts, awaken. And it can feel good in the moment. But it brings all of this other stuff with you into that relationship. She kept herself this way. And now she presents herself to her husband as this greatest gift ever. And look at what she says. I love this. 
Ladies, if you just want to freak your husband out this week, just like copy this verse, right? And so I want you to picture this scenario. She hasn't said a word up until now. Okay, and so she's just been there and present, and he's gone, and he's made her feel totally safe and totally loved and totally cared for. I, your past is gone. You're safe with me. This is a gentle experience. I want you to know how much I'm going to care for you and make this about you and show you love and show you grace and show you affection. And You're totally known and totally loved and totally accepted, and, and they start to kiss, and everybody's feeling good, and, and then she shouts this out. This is why I say, only for one for whom your soul shouts Awaken. Look at look what she does. Look, here's her words and all of this. What she read this with me. What does she say? Awake. Right? Like she doesn't just say, awake. Right? Like this is yeah, awake, right? Awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind, blow on my garden and let its spices flow. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. Like, ladies, I just want to say, you want to freak your husband out? Like the next time that you're about to be together, just shout out with everything in you, awake, right? Like, and he's going to, he'll kill over. He will. But it'll be doing what he loved, right? Like, it'll be a great entrance into the kingdom. And so here she is, right? Like, she's... She's right there. She's right there, and she's like, are you going to keep talking all day, or are we going to do something here? So, awake, let's do this. Like, listen to me. All throughout the Song of Solomon, what has she said? Oh, my beloved sisters and brothers, don't awaken love until what? It's time. Don't awaken. You can't put it back to sleep. Once it's awake, it's awake. Oh, my beloved brothers and sisters, don't awaken love before it's time. And now's the time. It's the right moment. They're in this exclusive husband and wife relationship. They preserve themselves for this moment. They've reserved and preserved themselves so that they can know God's plan for great sex. And they totally are able to give themselves over to one another for the one person for whom their soul shouts, Awake! In that moment, she says, awake on north wind. That was like a strong wind. And then the south wind, it's like this gentle breeze. She says, I, I want this time together with you to be incredible. Right? Let your mind do the wonder in there. You can figure it out. He says, come. It's your garden. I love that. It's your garden. My sexuality is yours. The apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, if you're married, you're not your own. You're your spouse's, and your spouse is yours. He says, you, it's not your own body. And, and so he says, only withhold yourselves from one another for a season if you both agree to devote yourselves to fasting and prayer. But then come together quickly so that the enemy doesn't tempt you. Right? God's plan was for married couples to have great sex regularly. Right? You, you want to know the chief way to bring temptation into your partner's life? Lock your garden. Close for business. You know what you did. You know what you said. Right? It's close for business. Right? Listen, it's still the other person's responsibility. They're supposed to be sexually pure regardless of what you do. It's their relationship with God. But you want to make your spouse not face never-ending temptation that comes with our culture? Then you meet emotionally physically and spiritually this need for intimacy that you both have look at what it says i love this so now they've been together she shouted awaken and chapter 5 verse 1 let's read this together here's what he says this is afterwards they're both laying there they're together they're naked they're unashamed they just enjoyed the pleasure of one another look at what he says verse 1 read this with me i came to my garden my sister, my bride, I gathered my myrrh with my spice. I ate my honeycomb with my honey. I drank my wine with what? My milk. How many times is the word my used there? Nine times. He says, this is us now. It's, we're together. It's no longer a me, it's a we. We're together in this. And so our sexuality is this gift for one another. And so I'm so grateful that you shared this exclusive gift with me it's this exclusivity to it listen write this down god's plan for great sex his plan to be known in a happy holy and healthy relationship it's got to be exclusively reserved and preserved for the one person for whom your soul shouts awaken it's only for your husband 
It's only for your wife. Listen, today, as I was thinking through, well, you know, how does this apply to us? How does this apply to us? So single people in the house, listen, listen to me. Um, do you know what kind of gift it is that you can give to your spouse, your future spouse? L- listen, you need to reserve and preserve your sexuality in a world that says, oh, it's totally fine, do whatever you want. Listen, it doesn't matter what your past has been. Maybe you've been married before. Maybe you've been divorced before. I see this with people all the time. They're like, well, what do I need to reserve and preserve my sexuality for? I've already been married once or twice or whatever it is. Like, it's not like I'm holding on to anything. And and so when they date, they start to be physically intimate with each other. They start to live together. And they have this sexual relationship before they're married. And I want to tell you, listen, statistically, even if you just go by that alone, it, it can ruin a relationship. If nothing else, it can ruin this time that you have where you say, listen, it's exclusive for you. Whatever your past is, aren't you thankful for the grace of Jesus that covers over every single sin? Aren't you grateful? But today you can come and say, you know what? I don't know if I'll ever get married again, but if I do, I want to make sure that I've reserved and preserved my sexuality for the one person for whom my soul will shout, awaken. Listen, um, for people that are friends, in the house today, this is totally not the message that culture says. Culture says, let's see every movie we can that has every bit of sexuality. Let's fill your brain with other people for whom your soul will shout, awaken. Let's read every book that we can imagine so we can get these fantasies in our head so that we can shout, awaken, over and over and over again in our brains. Listen, this is not what culture says, but God has called us, brothers and sisters, to make sure if we see a brother or sister who's stumbling along, caught up in any particular sin, we who are spiritual are supposed to lovingly, gently restore them. And say, look, do you know you're setting yourself up for failure in your marriage when you allow that in your home? Like you're filling your brain with all these other souls for whom you're shouting, awaken! And that's only meant to be one. It's just your spouse. Listen, for married couples in the house today, I, I, I just want to know, are you modeling this relationship for your kids? Are you modeling this relationship for your kids? Like, or are you comfortable saying, man, let's look at these people together. Look at that guy. Woo, he awakens. Look at that woman. Woo, she awakens me. Are are, are you watching things and letting stuff into your brain that awakens your sexuality that's only supposed to be for the one person to awaken? Are we modeling that for our kids, for our grandkids? What have we allowed to become acceptable in our homes, in our lives, in our mind's eyes? Listen, I want to encourage you. You need to reserve and preserve your sexuality for the one person for whom your soul shouts, awaken. Listen, today, let's think about sex God's way. And I promise if you do, it will be a happier, holier, and healthier way of being known than you've ever experienced before. Let's pray. Some of you in the house today, that maybe you are reserving and preserving your sexuality, but You're just not sure if God's ever going to meet your need. If he's ever going to send that person to be a part of your life. Or maybe you're married and you reserve and preserve, but your spouse doesn't. They're allowing things into their brains or into their eyes. That you know don't hold up to God's standard. You're just wondering, is there ever going to be a place where we're on the same page? Is there ever going to be a place where we're satisfied together and we live it out God's way? I just want to tell you, listen, um, in this moment, I just want you to pray that the Lord's provision would be perfect for you. As I read this book, The Song of Solomon, I just can't help but think over and over again how Jesus is the better Solomon. Just like Tony said about his exclusive love for his people. Do you know right now is sort of like this moment where you've been called into the chamber with the bridegroom. Jesus has washed you white as snow. He looks at you and he says, there's no flaw. There's no blemish. There's no defect in you. You are all together wonderful. The Bible says one day there's going to be this uniting with him that lasts forever and ever and ever 
And the greatest pleasures of this life, the greatest sexual moments, the greatest, most unbelievable experience that you've ever had, the most pleasure that you could ever even imagine, it pales in comparison to what every single moment is going to be like in heaven. When we're united with Jesus, face to face, no more sickness and no more sin. The Bible says he's going to have this great wedding supper As the church is finally at his home where he says you're totally safe and you're totally known and you're totally cared for. Listen, he is the one to fill your greatest longing and need. He's the one who will never let you down. There's others in this house today that um, maybe you're single and you say, you know what, I, I need to re-alter my mindset. I've been in this relationship, and I've allowed this sexuality to become a part of it. Listen, today, you can commit before the Lord that from this moment on, you're going to reserve and preserve your sexuality for the one person on your wedding night for whom your soul shouts, awake. Now listen, even if you've already done that God's grace is there his forgiveness is there his restoration is there he can make it brand new and what a great moment that would be if the Lord leads you to a wedding day to be able to say I saved this for you from that moment on it doesn't matter about my past I saved it from that moment on there are those in this house today that you're married and I just want to ask you are, are you listening to the voices of other people to shout awaken Do you find that at work or in the text messages or the Facebook stuff that you send out? Are are you watching things on your computer that shout awaken? That's not part of this exclusive relationship, married people. Are you reading things? Are you watching things that awaken that in your soul and don't honor this exclusivity that God says is only between you and your spouse? Listen, today would you just commit to put that away? Just to put it away. And say, God, you're going to have to help me, but I believe you can help me. I want there to be one voice that awakens. The one person that I shout, awaken for. Because I want it to be this beautiful moment like you've shown in your word. That every day would be like that day. Because there's no comparison and no distractions. And we can be totally safe. Parents in the house today, would you just pray right now for your kids? In a world that so sexually exploits everything. Would you pray right now for their sexuality? That the Lord would help you be able to model for them this relationship that's so exclusive. That we don't want anything to come into and distract from or take away from. Would you just pray that the Lord would preserve them? And they would see... That God's way is the best way. Lord, we just thank you for who you are. You're the lover of our souls. I pray your Holy Spirit would mend relationships. That you would wash us clean. And that we would live this way. Lord, in honor of what you've done. Because you're king over our sexuality. In Jesus' name we all pray together. God's people said, amen.